Okay, you should be live. All right, well, I, I, I think we're live. Uh, Dr. Furman, you know, technology has its uh, limits in this virtual world that we're in. But uh, welcome to this month's edition of Power Your Health Q&A. The, uh, a person whose reputation far precedes him, Dr. Joel Furman. Good to have you here with us tonight, Joel. Thank you. I'm so, looking forward to the fun we're going to have together. So I'm here in Ohio with uh, where it's about, uh, about uh, probably 15 degrees and about six inches of snow. How about you? Oh, really? It must be about 68 degrees like it always is here. And no snow, <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> no. No. Well, Dr. Furman, uh, we, we got a, a billion questions. Not a billion, but we got a lot of questions for you. So I, I hope that we can treat these to get as many in as we can, uh, kind of in a lightning round sort of way. So I'll just get right to it. Either that or I figured I'd go take a nap. <laughs> later. You can do that. So I'll just go uh, through uh, no particular order here. Uh, I've got one. First question is about bottled water. So the question is most bottled water, they claim, has salt and other extra ingredients to enhance the flavor. I wasn't aware of that, but is that true? Is there salt, sodium added to water? And then what about all these flavored waters that everybody talks about these, you know, just these little blink waters and all that. So first of all, is water, does, does bottled water have added sodium to it, to your knowledge? Well, some brands add electrolytes to it, a few of the brands, but not most of the brands. But yeah. I don't drink bottled water, or recommend bottled water anyway, because uh, number one, it's a waste of plastic for the environment. And number two, you don't know what kind of plastic residual is in the is in the water, residual plastic. So I use, you know, I obviously have a water purifier hooked onto my house sink with a spigot That's built into the have. sink. Yeah, reverse. So awesome. new, you know, years ago when I was a kid, my father had you know water distillers working in the basement in glass bottles. But now we have these um, reverse osmosis systems that really make super purified water. They're not expensive. They can hook in into your sink, and they're terrific. On that subject, are you a fan of those adapters that they put on shower heads to make your water to, you know, these carbon filters and that on your shower heads? Is that important, do you think? I, I don't know. Um, I think the, the issue there would be with the chlorine exposure into the gas, inhaling chlorine. I don't think it's that significant. It's different if you're working, and I think there is a concern if you're like a person who teaches swimming and has to live in a chlorinated pool, standing in a pool, inhaling the chlorinated, in an indoor situation, in an indoor pool, there's some concern there. But I don't think for the occasional shower, a little chlorine exposure in the water. And these enhanced, these enhanced fruit enhanced flavored waters and all that, is this just hype? Well, I mean, the, the I guess the idea is there's such a low amount of calories and there's such a small amount of enhancement of flavor, a little bit of lime or a little bit that it's not really a significant amount of calories and just make people enjoy the water better. But again, I'm still lobbying for people not to waste plastic and just to get water right out of their tap. Is there a recommended amount of water you think people should consume every day? Or is that, again, not important when you're on a nutritarian or a, a plant-based diet and you eat lots of fruits and vegetables? It's important to recognize that a lot of people can drink too much water when they're eating so healthfully and cause them to be hyponatremic and fatigued. And even you can get a seizure from over drinking water. The point I'm making is the, reg the recommendation of eight to 10 water, eight to 10 glasses of water a day doesn't apply to us nutritarians or natural hygienists because we're eating no salt in our diet. We're having so much fluid in what we're eating already and our water needs are so much less. Of course, I may be drinking, you know, two or three glasses of water a day, but then and when I exercise or play tennis or hike up a mountain, I'll certainly drink an extra quart or whatever I need to accommodate that water loss or the heat in the summer. But generally for, you know, regular um, activity, certainly two to four glasses is sufficient for most of us healthy eating or drink, we're getting so much fluid in other ways from what we're eating. So uh, psoriasis has been a big question that people... Uh... Uh, I've asked one says, can psoriasis on the hands and feet be cured, cured by eating a whole food plant-based diet? I stopped infusions, gave up all dairy. It seemed to clear up, but now a year later, it's starting up again. I don't know. Any advice for me? Is there something else I need to consider? Someone else says I've been uh, whole food plant-based for nine years and uh, nutritarian eating G-bombs for two years. I was hoping my psoriasis would be gone. I'm gluten and grain free with some improvement, but I want it gone. What should I be doing? Thank you for your information. I think you got to speak louder there. <laughs> um, 
No, but I, as you know, I've had a lot of experience in many patients with, with psoriasis who've made com complete recoveries from their psoriasis and some very interesting stories of cases to tell. But yes, she can get rid of her psoriasis, but it's a combination of eating right, but also making sure the body fat percent is low. I've seen patients, for example, even get rid of their psoriasis, eating an incredibly healthy diet and going on a fast and getting rid of their psoriasis and eat healthy again and their psoriasis come back eating the right foods just because they gained a little too much weight. What I'm saying right now is that their body fat can fuel the inflammation and the cellular replication in the skin that leads to psoriasis if they overeat regularly and get too... I remember one guy, he got rid of his psoriasis, but he was too thin and too malnourished. And so I had to get more calories and more nutrients into him. And then he gained back too much weight. His psoriasis came back again. We had to tweak it and get him just at the right level of, of health with the right amount of calories, not too low and not too high to keep his skin clear. But the point I'm making is this person still could be overeating. And also the omega-3 fatty, fatty index plays a role too. They can have too much inflammation from an omega-3 index that's too low that can contribute to the... Um, to their psoriasis, even on a plant-based diet. So there's an individual need and variance there, but typically we don't have too much trouble getting rid of people's psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Sometimes it may require, um, you know, tweaking of the diet, but usually we're not even using fasting as much as we're just using cutting back on calories and an earlier dinner and a lighter dinner because the problem with doing fasting, it'll get rid of it. But then if they go back to the way they were eating before, it could come back again. So we wanna get them to hone down that way of eating so they're right in that sweet spot to clear their skin, which just takes a little more time, but then could be more permanent. Speaking of sweet spots, uh, we have people, a uh, number of questions about cholesterol and people mm -hmm. get, get quite concerned about numbers. Are they too high? Are they LDL is too high? Are they the good cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. How should people think about cholesterol? Is this something where you really gotta be number conscious? I think people are overly concerned about the cholesterol number because that's something drugs can treat. So doctors in the medical profession generally focuses on the numbers because we have medications that can lower it. Just like with high blood pressure, diabetes, it's all about the numbers. You think you're okay because your cholesterol is treated lower, your blood pressure is treated lower, or your blood glucose is treated lower. You think it looks okay on paper, so you're okay, but you're not okay because you're still incurring the cause of disease and the numbers are being um, falsely and you know, pushed down. So I'm saying you know, a lot of heart attacks, maybe the majority of heart attacks occur today with people who are on statins, who have their cholesterol pushed lower and they're still having heart attacks. So certainly cholesterol is not the only bad actor and oxidized LDL is the main bad actor in heart attack causation. We're not talking about LDL cholesterol, we're talking about in particular, a small subset of the LDL caused called oxidized LDL. And when your diet is very high in antioxidants, you know, the full complement of nutrients from greens and onions and mushrooms and berries and all these, then your, your oxidized LDL is very low. So even your, your LDL cholesterol could be 120, but your oxidized LDL could be, you know, 20, could be so low that you're protected from heart disease. So what I'm saying is it's more about your body weight, your exercise tolerance, how healthy you're eating, and the overall quality of your diet is more important than what your cholesterol runs. So certainly we're concerned if people's cholesterol are unusually super high, you know, but basically if it's a little high and they're eating right and their oxidized LDL is favorable, it's not much of a concern. I would say an LDL cholesterol medicated to, an, to 70 or 80 is not as good as a person who's eating right and in great health with an LDL cholesterol of 120 with a, with no, with a very low oxidized LDL eating a, high, eating a high nutrient diet. So I would be less concerned about the numbers and more about the quality of what you're eating. Yes, there is a test for oxidized LDL. And that test is what? Oxidized LDL. Just a blood test that you can mm -hmm. request? Sure. Got it. Okay. I'm not suggesting that that's necessary though. I'm not encouraging people to get more testing. I'm saying eat right, keep yourself fit and slim and don't worry so much about your cholesterol, especially unless it's very high. Okay. Hypothyroidism is another one that, you know, people with goiters and, and you know, do they, and, and, and must, is medication the only answer to control your TSH levels and all that? What has been your experience on a nutritarian diet and, uh, and a whole food plant-based diet and in controlling and overcoming, even reversing 
hypothyroidism or is it is it a tough one? Is that a tough one? No, it's, it doesn't really reverse through, through nutritional excellence. In other words, once the thyroid gland is destroyed, it's very rare. I have had some cases that got better, but they were young people who we caught getting going off when they were just starting. Once the person has it for years, I haven't seen that it reverses themselves, except for the fact that when people are overweight, they lose weight and they get healthier and need less hormone. But if, they're di if their hypothyroidism is significant, then they're going to be on the medications for some medication, at least forever. Now, that doesn't mean I don't see all the time people who are given medication with borderline thyroid conditions who didn't need to be on medications. People with a TSH of six or eight or 12 who are able to get their, keep their TSH under control. And there are some people who are, who maybe are, who TSH elevated because of iodine deficiency and supplying them with regular, with a normal amount of iodine could bring their thyroid back to normal. But that's not that typical. Those are more unusual cases. The more typical everyday case is a person has um, lost the function of the thyroid gland due to an autoimmune attack on the thyroid, and those don't seem to come back again. And they, those people still require some degree of thyroid replacement. And I don't recommend generally they use armor thyroid and the natural thyroids that use T4 and T3. I'm recommending they use a regular like Levoxyl, um, Levoxyl Levothyroxine or Synthroid, which is just T4 because the extra T3 is more excitatory for their heart and could be more trigger in atrial fibrillation or anxiety. It's more lifespan promoting just to supply T4, let the body make the T3 from that it needs. And lastly, we're trying to moderately slow down our metabolic rate by eating less calories. And we do so, we notice that in the normal range of free T4, of free T4 we see longer life in the bottom half of normal and more heart attacks, more irregular heartbeats in the top half of the normal range. It means that if you're requiring thyroid hormone, you shouldn't medicate yourself to push your TSA below two. You should, and you shouldn't take thyroid medication if your TS, to push your thyroid medication, to push your TSH that low. If you're pushing your TSH that low, you're overtaking thyroid medication. It's ideal to have your TSH between two and four, not between one and two. So certainly above, you know, so what I'm saying right now is if you need thyroid medication, don't overuse it. Use the minimal amount necessary to keep your TSH in that favor most favorable range. Got it. Dr. Furman, there are a lot of questions about specific conditions like this. So just as a, as a reference point going forward for our viewers and listeners here, if people want to have a consultation with Dr. Furman, can they do that? And how do they do that? Well, I'm not really seeing patients regularly. I do have an Ask the Doctor forum in my website where people join the membership, a part of the membership of the website at the level where they can participate in the Ask the Doctor forum and ask me questions. That way they've signed a consent to have the, to, for educational purposes to me to openly share the conversations with them among other members so people can read what I'm saying to everybody and learn from them. So they're part of the overall um, connected network on my website, and they can ask me any questions they want there. And I, and I do have some people that come to San Diego um, to see me at my retreat here, um, but, but I'm no longer in New Jersey. I'm no longer have a full-time medical practice. And the problem with phone consultations is that you can't be licensed in every state. So I'm, I don't really do many phone consultations either. I mostly require people to come to the retreat or to at least be a person that is considering coming, staying here, and I'll talk to them about their condition because they're considering coming here and I have to learn about their problems and give them some advice before they get here. So I very often give a mini consultation to people who are considering coming to the retreat to re, um, for a period of time. But generally, but generally speaking, they want my input. They should just join the website. It's the easiest way to do it. And beyond that, they come, they can stay at the retreat and can address every health issue in the world that they want. Right. Most of my time is spent caring for the medical needs of the people who are here at the retreat. Um, so I'm not, you know, some, and I'm not working as many hours as I used to work. And, and again, just to give you the opportunity uh, to, to talk about how people, uh, how people can book a stay at the retreat. How does that work? You want to take a minute just to explain how that works? Where do they sign up? Um, they would call the phone number. They would, they would, I think the, the website, drfermancom slash, ETL, Eat to Live Retreat, they would just go to that page. And if you go to the front page of my website, it says retreat. And you just go to that, click on it. 
It'll tell you a little bit about it, have a little video, and it'll have a phone number to call. And the phone number puts you on the phone with one of my staff or my wife, and they, can sit, they talk to you and tell you about it and see if you're a candidate. The, the other issue with the retreat is we don't accept people that stay less than 30 days. So it's mostly for because we have limited rooms and people don't really benefit it for short term stays, especially when they have um, food addictions or medical conditions. They really need to be engrossed in this and learn all the factors to get well and, and get. So this becomes the way they prefer to eat, learn how to make, you know, any, anyway, we're we're mostly for people who are staying longer than 30, 30 days or longer. Well, if I could just add a gratuitous uh, comment here, uh, Juan and I have been at Dr. Furman's uh, Eat to Live Retreat. It is a beautiful, beautiful setting. You you have a little slice of paradise on, in the hills of San Diego. So it's a great place to heal, a great place to rest, and the best place in the world to eat. <laughs> yeah, we have great chefs. Yeah, and sure. plus, we have a saltwater pool, a pickleball court, basketball, hiking trails, 100 miles, you know, next to a park, and it's all beautiful. types of recreational um, okay. things to do. So it's more of a fun place, too. You know, it's a it is. So, fun, place, fun place to heal. And I love it. Yeah, if you, if, if you got to go someplace to get well, might as well go to a place where you can have fun at it at the same time. And, and right, fun, great food and have a great, great environment. Right. Great let's, weather. Get back, let's get back to some questions here because we got a lot of them here. Supplements. There's lots of questions about supplements here. So one of them is uh, zinc. You know, you've heard a lot about in the COVID era. That's one of those uh, secret things. They say, well, just increase your zinc level and you'll you'll be protected against COVID. So I, I've had the question. I'll just run down them. the three. The th There's four four big ones that people have asked me here uh, repeatedly about how much zinc should we take? B12, vitamin D, and DHA. Those are four, four supplements. That people, and then protein. We'll get to protein and should we supplement as you get older. Those, let's stay in the supplement realm. So if you want to kind of run down those, let's start with zinc. Is zinc really a valuable adjunct to a, a, a nutritarian or whole food, natural hygiene, plant-based diet? I think zinc is one of the most important elements, especially as people age. Here's the thing, is that... For most of us young, healthy people, taking zinc is not going to make much of a difference. We already have healthy and we're getting, it's not that plant foods don't have zinc. It's that the phytic acid binds zinc and zinc is more easier to absorb from, from animal products, oysters, fish, seafood, salamanders, snakes. You get more zinc from, small, from animals and seafood. The point is, is that as we age and our immune system falters, we absorb zinc less. And the studies show that um, vegans are borderline low in zinc, and as they age, their increased risk of infectious-related death or even cancer-related death, like prostate cancer, um, due to deficiencies in zinc. So it does make sense to make sure we have adequate zinc as the ability to absorb zinc decreases with digestive, um, diminishing digestive um, bioavailability with aging. So yes, the studies indicate that we have available that using a low supplement of zinc in vegan populations decreases cancer rates and decreases risk of infectious related death, including pneumonia, and certainly most likely COVID too. It doesn't mean you have to take a lot of zinc. It just means take a little bit of extra zinc because we don't, because we're only absorbing about half, less than half as much zinc as, some, as somebody else who's using some animal product in their diet. Is so there a plant-based source of zinc? zinc? What's that? Is there a plant-based source of zinc? Zinc is all plant-based. Yeah, the zinc supplements are minerals. They're, they're, min they're not. Uh, is it a whole food, you know, like, you know, there's, you can use kelp if you want additional iodine and things like that. You know, uh, is there, a, is there a, a whole food that you can use? As all all these whole foods have zinc in them. Plants are not deficient in zinc, but, they, but because of the plant-based diet, it makes the zinc less bioavailable. We have less absorption. So the inclusion of animal, so people who eat animal products definitely get more zinc in their diet. So I'm saying zinc is one of those supplements that do benefit many people, especially as they age. So in the, in the supplement I recommend, and I include the zinc, the vitamin D, the K2, the B12, and the iodine in there to cover people for these nutrients that are marginally suboptimal on a nutritarian or a plant-based diet. What I'm saying is there's optimal range for nutrient intake with certain nutrients. And this philosophical idea that humans are plant are vegans and the plant-based diet or eating natural foods must have the perfect amount of all nutrients, that's a religious or philosophical viewpoint that the science does not support. If you're looking for science alone 
and you want to go by what the evidence shows and not go for what you want to believe, then you have to say, well, maybe here there's some things that we can do to make the diet even better. And because we're obviously, um, there's no history or society through human history of people who follow such a strict, strict veganism through generations and seeing the outcomes. So we can't just assume a vegan diet is adequate in all these things. We have to look at evidence in an unbiased m and manner and weigh if there might be an advantage to including some of these nutrients that are more readily available through animal products. So I think it's valid then, and we do know that people have less infectious related death with a small amount of zinc supplementation, even people that are eating meat that are high in zinc. So sometimes, so a, a small amount of zinc, and we're talking about the RDI around 10 micrograms or you know, based on 10 to 15. So having somewhere between seven, you know, adding a little extra zinc, seven and a half to 15 extra micrograms of zinc a day is not going to cause anybody harm. But I'm also saying with the caveat that don't be too concerned about it if you're young and healthy. But as you get older, it's more important. As you get older and your immune system starts to wane and your digestive capacity starts to wane, it's more important to make sure you have adequate zinc. I Thank certainly, you. yeah, go ahead. So Dr. Longo and others that have written about, you know, fasting mimicking diets and aging and that have talked about adding, increasing your protein intake as you get older and mm -hmm. protein intake, there's, there's a million protein powders and, and there's been an explosion in plant-based protein powders for pea proteins to sunflower proteins to watermelon seeds, to everything. Uh, what are your thoughts about supplementing with these protein powders? Uh, the, the plant-based protein powders. How valuable is that? Is too much? Is there? Can there be too much of this stuff? How do you well, look? At it? Before I answer that, can I just state that it's an important question because we know that the most striking evidence in the scientific literature over the last ten years has been that increasing animal protein in the diet accelerates a more premature death, but increasing plant protein makes people live longer. It really shows with many hundreds of thousands and multiple studies corroborating each other that increasing plant protein it, um, enhances your ability to be healthy at 100 years old. And what I'm saying right now, that means a starch-based diet, a rice-based diet, a macrobiotic-based diet, a potato-based diet, a fruit-based diet, a fruitarian diet. A low, all these diets, all these vegan advocates advocating their favorite diets are not giving people optimal advice. That's where I think not to, where a nutritarian diet shines because the highest protein containing plant foods are green vegetables, beans, and nuts and seeds. And the, the way we get a, a plant-based diet too low in protein is by eating too much fruit or too much carb or too much rice or potato or too, you know, but mostly it's too much fruit. And the tendency is to eat a lot of fruit and a little bit of vegetables. And I'm saying, no, include those cooked beans. Don't eat all raw food. Include those cooked beans. Eat raw, but have cooked green vegetables with that to increase your protein. And of course, also eat sufficient amount of nuts and seeds, especially the higher protein nuts and seeds. And, and we know sunflower seeds and hemp seeds and Mediterranean pine nuts and soybeans are super high in protein. So before you launch to a protein powder, let's just ask, why don't you just eat some dried soybeans or open a can of black soybeans and have, are you having that? Are you having azuki beans? Are you eating some hemp seeds in your diet? Are you eating sunflower seeds? Are you eating sufficient amounts of green vegetables? Are you eating a big salad every day with another serving of a solid board of solid vegetables like broccoli or artichokes, which are high in protein? In other words, what I'm saying right now, the nutritarian diet that kind of, I use that term to describe a diet of natural plants, but I don't say whole, I don't say a whole food plant-based because whole food plant-based leads too many options for dietary sloppiness and overeating fruit and rice and potato or not eating a diet with enough nutritional diversity and making the diet too low in protein. And we see studies in England, studies on, on vegans showing they have higher hip fracture rates due to the low protein content of their diet and the low calcium content of their diet. And if you analyze the nutritarian diet with, a, you know, with, a half, with at least a half a cup of beans every day and at least a pound of vegetables a day with at, least a, with at least two ounces of nuts a day, we get double the protein that most vegans are on. However, and I didn't answer your questions about the other supplements, but however, there are some cases that if we follow IGF-1 as people get older 
And as the bioavailability and digestibility of protein goes down, if their IGF-1 is dropping too low as they're aging and they're losing weight, they could increase the risk of frailty and their immune system function can decrease. There are indications where using some supplemental protein might be valuable, but not for the general population, mostly only for, let's say, people who aren't digesting as well after the age of 75 or 80, and they're losing muscle mass. Um, and you had the option of giving them more tofu and more soybeans and more hemp seeds. And there was, you know, so we could, we don't necessarily have to use a protein supplement because maybe we can increase the tweak their diet to enhance the protein content. But in some people, it makes it easier for them. And as you know, there are some occasional people who need some animal product in their diet, that even the pr plant protein isn't sufficient because they still have muscle wasting as they age, because people were not all robots of each other. And we're not designing a diet for everybody. We're designing a guidelines for everybody. And this tweaking that can occur, if people don't thrive on that way of eating, we have to tweak the diet accordingly. So some people may even require egg whites or right, require something because they're getting too much muscle and wasting with aging. So the answer to the question is most people don't need it, but occasionally a person might need that. And occasionally a person might even need some animal product if their IGF-1 is dropping too low and they're getting too much muscle wasting. Is there um, a danger of taking too much? So let's just assume you're doing, you're doing the G-bombs and you're getting your beans and you're doing tofu and these sort of things. Is there a danger in, in, in over-proteinizing your body with these powders? There is if you're taking um, isolated soy protein, which is so protein concentrated, it could push your IGF-1 too high. It would, unless you were monitoring IGF-1 to make sure it wasn't pushing too high. And I'd much prefer people just ate the basic soy product and not the isolated soy protein. As far as the pumpkin and pea proteins and the rice proteins, I don't recommend either because they're high in arsenic and they're contaminated. So it's mostly the pea, pumpkin and hemp um, proteins. And a lot of these protein powders have additives and sweeteners and other types of things that you much better getting it from the real food. So in most cases, we're just using hemp seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. And, and soy products and other, and don't forget Mediterranean pine nuts are super high in protein. I work with a lot of world-class and professional athletes. I have, you know, so, and I, and I've even sent them these box, these um, jars of Mediterranean pine nuts so they can use that to get their extra protein and to, with the sunflower seeds and all the greens they're I'll eating. Also, really I'll well. also give another gratuitous plug to drfurman.com because I had never eaten Mediterranean pine nuts before till I bought some of yours or they are. They're not like any pine nuts you buy anywhere in the world. They're extraordinary. They, they really have a flavor to them, a, a nuttiness to them that's outstanding. They're really good. Yeah, the, the Asian pine nuts or the Chinese pine nuts can be like 12% protein, whereas the Mediterranean pine nuts can be 38% protein. You know, it's still the, there's, and what's weird is that there are probably, you know, almost a thousand different varieties or certainly hundreds of varieties of pine nuts. And we only have like two or three available in the marketplace. I would love us to have, be able to have, you know, hundreds of varieties of pine nuts, like, you know, from different trees, but that's not available in today's market. So you mentioned uh, soy products. So people ask about tempeh and and tofu and these kind of products. I guess what's your what what are you a fan of those kinds of of, of those kind of soy derivative products? As I'm, 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 your, yes, I think, tempeh is, I think tempeh is a good product, except when you pick some of these up and you see other ingredients added to it that shouldn't be in there. You know what I mean? I look at the box and say, oh, I'm not getting that tempeh. There's some other crap in there. But you know, but yes, tempeh can be a healthy product. But basically, tofu and soy milk are made from soy milk. Tofu is made from soy milk, which has the fiber removed. It's not a whole food. So I much prefer people to use whole soybeans in the form of edamame. Um, canned black soybeans, like the Eden brand of canned black soybeans is good. And to buy the dried soybeans that you soak and cook into chilies and dishes and soups, which are more whole foods because you get more of the anti-cancer benefit of soy. And soy is a remarkable food because... It blocks the E1 receptors, the estrogen receptors on breast and prostate tissue, so it doesn't get it stimulated with excess hormone, with estrogens, but it stimulates the S E2 receptors on bones and muscles to help maintain bone mass when, when women go through menopause. So it's an excellent food for people to use. So online, uh, the, fright sing, the Fright Singer raises a question about osteoporosis, and I've had a lot of those questions. And they, they, they ask you the value of uh, a weighted vest, eating lots of greens, to eating the estrogen. Uh, do you recommend any of these bioidentical pro hormones? What do people do as they get older and they are being diagnosed with osteoporosis, osteopenia, and the like? 
Well, I, I teach people that the word osteopenia or osteoporosis, meaning weakened bones, accompanies weakened muscles. That bones get more dense as muscles get stronger and bones get weaker as muscles get weaker. And so the person is not staying physically fit and lifting heavy weights and maintaining their muscle strength. And a lot of times swimming and biking and even running is not sufficiently stimulating muscle growth and muscle strength as much as weightlifting would be. And wearing the weighted vest is excellent. I don't know what the tahini, she, what she's doing with tahini. Tahini does not high in calcium or protein because um, the, they use the sesame seeds that are, that are hulled already. So it's not tahini, it's greens and beans and nuts and seeds in general. And estrogen levels, and estrogen prescribed by physicians, bioidentical or not, is still gonna increase risk of breast cancer and even heart attack risks. So estrogens and the, the, um, the bisphosphonate drugs to, to strengthen bones also have detrimental effects at increasing risk of fra mid fracture, of mid, mid femur fracture, or osteonecrosis of the draw, or increasing atrial fibrillation. It puts you at needless risks. It's much better to do this in the gym by lifting heavy weights, we use, and we have a, you know, we use a power plate with women with, and give them weights where they're actually lifting heavy objects on the power plate. And you don't have to pick them up over your head. You just got to pick them up off a chair for a few inches. In other words, I might just be taking the, the weights in my hand and picking them up that much, just a little bit and holding them up on the vibrating platform and putting them back down again on, 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 a, on a bench and lifting them off the bench again. The point is that with the right type of exercise program, you're actually lifting heavy weights for you with your legs and your back and your, take, and your diet is otherwise high enough in protein and calcium, but protein's important here to build muscle and, and we don't want to have a person thinking they're going to build muscle by living on nothing but fruit. They have to eat their vegetables and the beans and the nuts. So that was another question, uh, several questions again about how much exercise, what kind of exercise do you recommend? Particularly, again, a lot of our, a lot of our listeners and viewers are older and want to know, is that a time for more exercise? What kind of exercise? How much a day, every other day? What kind Multiple, of exercise? Yeah, we should do some exercise and movements a few times a day. Probably two times a day or three times a day would be good. Exercise, break up your day with small amounts of exercise. You can go for a long walk or do some aggressive exercise and you wouldn't do it multiple times a day, but it's better to, but it's really good to exercise if you're not going out there for a long exercise, it's better to do some exercise regularly throughout the day. So not two or three times a week. We're talking about two or three times a day doing something. But let well, me just say, most people who fall down and break their hips, they don't fall forwards and break their hips or fall backwards and break their hips. They fall to the side and break their hip. It's side, it's they've lost their proprioception and agility catching themselves with side motion. So when, what I do when I do exercise classes with people, and especially here at the retreat, we do a lot of exercise where they're moving and stopping, moving side to side, that they're like shuffling to one side, stopping, shuffling back to the other side, stepping across in front to one side, stepping in back to one side, moving back to the other side. So we're giving people, we're developing that ability to move side to side. Here, I'll put this, I'll try to show, show so you can get the, to get my feet in here. So I'm like stepping out to the side and coming back across in front and stepping out to the side and going back in the back. I might just do a lot. I might do a shuffle step to the side and stopping, a shuffle step to the other side and stopping and coming back or two shuffles and stopping, and two shuffles and coming back. So in, in other words, we're using weight bearing exercise and we're getting the stuff where we're bending and coming up and down for our back too. And we're doing that side to side motion as we move and stop to the side and bend and come back up again. If you can't bend all the way, just bend part way down and come back up. But moving sideways and pushing yourself back to center as you're going side to side. And then I'm going to pick up the desk. And even if it, I'm going to try to pick up a desk and put some pressure upward, where isometrically putting some pressure on the spine as you're pulling upward on that. So we do divine, design a program specifically to meet the needs of individuals, because obviously people have different levels of what they can handle and what they're capable of doing. But generally, we want people moving side to side and lifting heavier weights and keeping their strength, their agility, and of course, their bone mass as they age with excellent nutrition. And all these things go, again, go together. You can't medicate your bones to your muscles to be stronger and your bones to be thicker. You have to work them to get bigger. And of course, with people that are older, we often are keeping them agile 
and keeping them um, mobile so they're not going to fall and cognizant of making the house, making sure they're not, not, not um, you know, rugs they can trip over and careful when they get up at night to go to the bathroom that would make doing monitoring people to make sure they're not at high risk of tripping and falling. Someone, Robbie Ellis, just asked, is climbing steps every day good for bones or having a stepper, one of those steppers that you can buy? It's good, but it's not as good as what I'm telling you because I'm saying that a, a stepper's better than a bike because a bike's too smooth. You have to have some impact and having a vibration platform or impact where you're jumping up and down off a step or kind of jogging in place or jumping in place like jump rope or hopping on one foot all these things that are more that have more impact hopping skipping jogging using jogging using a vibration platform or jumping up and down on a step and back down again or moving side to side so there are, you can use the steps in a way to exercise off them but the smoothness of just walking on a stairmaster is not going to have the impact factor where you build back bone as much as if there was something that had a little more um, pattern to it and smacking. So the same it. Thing, I assume the same thing is true with a treadmill. You look at a treadmill the same as a bike? No, a treadmill will be better for a bike because the, tre the bike is too smooth. The treadmill has a little more impact. But, uh, you know, treadmills are particularly dangerous for people. If they fall on it, they can really s scrape and get hurt badly. And for an older person, we're very careful with the use of treadmills and with the elderly because they can trip and fall on a treadmill and get hurt pretty badly on them. By, so the way, by the way, I, I, I wanted to mention that uh, I, I don't know if it, in your growing up in the natural hygiene movement like I did, if you had, if you grew up with Dr. Benish, who was one of our founders, because Dr. Benish, uh, it's like you're channeling Dr. Benish when you talk about having, you know, lots of lots of vegetables, nuts, seeds, exercising, lifting heavy weights. That was Dr. Benish personified. Really, yeah. people having too much fruit, always adding nuts into his orange juice and ground up sunflower seeds and almonds and all that. that you're channeling right. Dr. Benish. All right. There you go. So, all right, on to other questions here. Um, there, well, I, I couldn't, we couldn't leave this uh, thing tonight without asking some questions about COVID. And one of the questions about COVID was how protective from COVID is a nutritarian whole plant food diet and lifestyle, in your opinion? Is it enough? Yes. And, and the answer. The answer is that it doesn't mean you're not going to get COVID. I even got COVID. It means that when you get, yeah, right. So it means that where our immune system can handle it. We're not going to die from it, put, put in a hospital because of it. And so we get over it. So, um, so the, we know that it's well known that the morbidity and mortality from COVID happens in people that are um, in, in poor health with comorbidities that are overweight. And, and don't forget, 89% of Americans are overweight. And out of the 11% that are not overweight, most of the people that are normal are smokers and drinkers and poor eaters. It's only 2.4% of Americans that are normal weight because they eat relatively healthfully and exercise regularly. That's 2.4%. They're not eating plant-based nutritarian diets, the 2.4%. They're just eating healthy by more American standards. In other words, real healthy people are more unusual. And we're certainly... Um, not saying that COVID is putting the population at risk is because they've already put themselves at risk with the diet they've been eating. And of course, they're more susceptible to the damage from novel viruses than we are. So certainly, um, you know, my, of course, um, viewpoint is why wouldn't you, why wouldn't the thought of getting cancer make you eat healthy? Why wouldn't the thought of having a heart attack make you eat healthy? Maybe because it's 20 years or 30 years in the future and you think you're young enough not to worry about it now. I don't know what people are thinking. They're crazy. But the COVID thing could kill people in a month or in six months, and they're still not changing their diets. It's just amazing how processed food and the conventional way of eating and thinking has taken over people's minds. So they've lost the keys to the bank. When I, when I interviewed, uh, when, when Dr. Goldhammer was on our Power of Health Q&A a few months ago, he yeah. talked about that there could be an argument for people that are older in age with comorbidities that a vaccine, there might be a risk benefit ratio that, of course. The hospital. Do you agree with that? Yes. I think that, you know, I, I wouldn't want to take the risk of vaccines myself and my family because obviously we're so healthy. Why take that risk, the potential risk of long term effect down the road? Nobody's studying the long term effects of every medical intervention. 
has some risk associated with it and has, has pro-inflammatory and toxic elements to it and cumulatively could cause damage. We're not doing studies and following people on these new vaccines 20 years from now, seeing if they cause extra damage down the road with increased risk of some cancer or something. We don't know. Why take that risk if you're already protected to be a good diet? But when you're unhealthy and overweight with comorbidities, then the person might want to take that risk of increasing the risk of even a cardiomyopathy or a inflammation or cancer or Bacillian Barre or some kind of risk because the COVID risk is so high for them because they're otherwise so unhealthy. So yeah, it has to be individualized, but I don't want people to, I don't want, I don't think it should be forced on people. It should be an individual decision based on a person's evaluation of their risk benefit ratio. For myself and people I'm close to, we prefer to take, to, to let, to eat, live healthfully and not to incur the need, not to incur the need for medicinal substances being injected in our body. So speaking of uh, what you and your family, uh, a couple of people asked, what is the typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the Furman household? Which I assume is at the Eat to Live retreat too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, sometimes I eat something in the house and sometimes I go up to the retreat and eat something there. But usually what I'm eating is, I usually have a, a tablespoon of seeds like, hemp seeds, flax seeds, and chia seeds. And I, I usually have the seeds in the morning. I might have other nuts later in the day, but I'm usually eating my seeds in the morning. So I might put that seeds in with some fruit or in with some oat rum, steel cut oats, or in with some um, something else like um, wild blueberries or something. Or this morning I had a cherimoya, if you know what a cherimoya is. I mixed it in with my seeds. But so I, my, I'm usually eating a somewhat light breakfast. And sometimes I have a glass of vegetable juice for more breakfast with like carrot and beet and greens in there and bok choy. And I have some juice with little seeds and berries of fruit and some kumquats or something like that. So I'm, I'm usually eating a lighter breakfast, but I'm eating a heavier lunch when my lunch is a large salad. And I chop up the salad into little pieces so I can fit it in the bowl. And I put in a little bit of like edamame or other bean in there. And I put some arugula or watercress or or on bok choy on top of it, or baby kale, or some sprouts on top of the lettuce. I try to make it half lettuce and half these other concentrated um, cruciferous vegetables or sprouts. Because don't forget, don't throw lettuce out the window here. Lettuce is still a superfood. And le dark green lettuces are full of sulfoquinibose, which is tremendously protective to the digestive tract lining and great for people's health. So I still have that salad. Um, is there a difference between, in a related question, one of the questions was, is there a difference between romaine lettuce, green leaf lettuce, iceberg lettuce, uh, or is all lettuce lettuce? All just well, the, the iceberg lettuce is more white and it's not going to be as nutritious because it forms a head and it's blocked from the sun. Like the outer leaves of the cabbage that are green, or we take cabbage that's not headed, and that's why we use bok choy because the leaves are sun exposed or more nutritious. I'm a bok choy fanatic. I'm a bok choy, I have bok choy mania because I love growing bok choy in the garden because it doesn't attract flies and white flies and aphids and slugs. It seems to be insect resistant and it grows terrifically. And it's such a beautiful plant and you can cook it. You can eat it raw. You can put it in your salad. It tastes mild. You can juice it. It's just an incredible food. So I do grow a lot of bok choy. So but what I'm saying is the headed, the headed lettuce, the white iceberg, is not, it's not bad for you but it's not as nutritious and longevity promoting as the, as the other greens. So we talked about breakfast. We talked about lunch. I didn't also say that for lunch, I also have a bowl of vegetable bean soup too, and one piece of fruit for dessert. So I have big salad. And sometimes I don't eat that much soup because I ate the whole salad and the piece of fruit. And I'm feeling like it kind of, so I had maybe a half a bowl of soup. That's usually a way I get some extra beans and mushrooms into me and the bean and mushroom soup for lunch with the salad. So I make the lunch the main meal of the day. So breakfast and dinner are somewhat lighter. And so what is dinner? Dinner, I, you know, I didn't have room in my stomach to eat enough to eat all the different raw vegetables at lunch. I didn't have the raw pepper. I didn't have the raw carrots, the raw jicama, the snow pea pods, the bok choy. I just had all the leafy greens with some tomatoes and sprouts. And I had some beans in there. I, I can only eat so much food. So at dinner, I start out with some other types of raw vegetables that I didn't have a chance to eat at lunch. So I'll eat the other raw vegetables with a dip, like a hummus dip or a salsa dip or a you know, guacamole dip or a nut-based dip. And then I'll usually have a mixed walked vegetable dish, you know, some kind of mixed cooked vegetables at night. And I love to eat my favorite vegetables, of course, are string beans, 
uh, and artichoke hearts. I eat a ton of string beans and artichoke hearts at night, but the, you know we'll mix it in, sometimes in wok with cabbage and mushrooms and onions and. You really got to work at it. To get, art, to get to the artichoke hearts, that's a lot of work to get to a lot of artichoke hearts. And I buy frozen artichoke hearts too. Where yeah. you just have a whole bag of frozen artichoke. When I'm traveling, I'm eating like snacking on frozen artichoke hearts on a plane instead of eating a meal. But yeah, so I know artichoke. But when you have a whole artichoke, eat the whole artichoke. When you eat the inner parts of the seed, eat the stem, eat as much of it as you can. But I, I love artichokes too. But in any case, I might put that on a bed of spaghetti squash, zucchini noodles, or or any kind of or quinoa, or um, or sometimes. Um, some bean pasta, you know, we don't, so that and we're putting mostly a zucchini vegetable dish, tomato sauce, some kind of mixed vegetable dish with a lot of greens in it. So I'm getting more cooked greens in my diet at night because I didn't have the space to put all those cooked greens or the other raw vegetables. So I'm trying to have variety. So the variety of vegetables I choose to eat at night are different from the variety of vegetables I choose to eat at lunch. So I'm getting the full spectrum of all these different types of vegetables in. So a question just popped up about fermented foods like sauerkraut and pickled things. And I'm wondering what, what you're fan, what, whether you're a fan of those. I don't recall having them at the retreat when I was there. So I guess I'm wondering your observation. Are these some superfoods that really do enhance your digestion and, uh, and create a perfect biome? Or, or is this just a lot of hype? Well, don't forget the four food variety and fiber variety creates the best microbiome. You can't even take probiotics to have a great microbiome because they don't have enough diverse um, bacteria in them. We, there's hundreds, thousands of different bacteria varieties that we get when we eat a variety of food. So we have this unprecedented opportunity in human history to eat an incredible variety in, in our today's diet. So we're not duplicating a blue zone. A blue zone isn't even healthy compared to a nutritarian diet. It's like it's not even in the, in the ballpark of being a, a, a blue zone because they're eating such a narrow amount of food that their ancestors ate and they're not eating it that healthy. It's not even based on science, but in any case, it's better than the American diet. But the point I'm making now is that for the best microbiome, the two raw foods are the raw cruciferous greens and the raw scallion and onion. And the two cooked foods are beans, including a variety of beans and a variety of cooked mushrooms in your diet too. That gives you the most favorable microbiome. So yes, we can have the, it is important to have a favorable microbiome. We do it by eating the right type of diet. And we're talking about a, different, a lot of variety of foods in our diet that gives us that healthier microbiome. And your body automatically builds the best bacteria. Even with fermented foods may help people with a, with a very narrow microbiome because they're eating meats and sweets. They're eating more conventionally. So taking in some fermented foods may offer some um, slight benefits, but eating fermented foods is not necessary for people to eat, for to people to be healthy, we actually ferment the, we degrade the, um, the resistant starch in beans, for example, and cause, um, and, and produce the bacteria as a result of the degradation of those, um, of those fibers. So you don't need to eat fermented foods to be healthy. So uh, I just want to stay with a, a point because it's always been uh, one of the, uh, one of the favorite lines of yours that I, that I often cite is when you say that your salad should be your main course, and that uh, and and somehow I, I it has been my observation in the explosion of of uh, all the cooking in the whole food plant based diet world, the salads just kind of disappear. There, it's it's a minor thing. We have everything else, but salads in the old fashioned way with lettuce and bok choy and carrots and celery and it, right is, is that is that something we've we've gotten away from. Maybe think? some people have, but it should, but absolutely. I tell people to put a big sign in the refrigerator. This is the salad is the main dish and at least one meal a day, not a soup bowl size, but a full nine inch serving bowl size of salad of a chopped salad with a lot of what we're talking about in here. That's the, that's a hallmark that dif that differentiates a nutritarian diet from some of the other modern diets people are eating that are, you know, that we're talking about that are not ideally designed to maximize human lifespan. So the major recipe the most important recipe people have to learn are how to make healthy, good tasting salad dressings out of nuts and seeds instead of oil and salt and grease to make it nuts, to make a healthy nut and seed based dressing and eat a big salad at least once a day. And lastly, people are no, have to pay attention to how well they chew that salad. You have to try to liquefy every mouthful. And that means concentrate on not swallowing. So you keep the food in your mouth longer and chew it more until it's liquefied. 
because as you break open each cell, you liberate or form more of these beneficial compounds with these live enzymes like myrosinase that's in the green cruciferous vegetables and the, and the, and the alienase that's in the onion. So it's true that when you, that, the, that these foods do have enzymes that are important and, they, and the enzymes form beneficial chemicals in the mouth as you chew the food and mix the, all the enzymes with the food together. The better you chew, the more beneficial compounds you're forming. So does that mean you're not a fan of smoothies? Well, no. I mean, you, when you blend them in the blender, you're also breaking up and mixing the enzymes and forming the beneficial compounds. I don't want people to drink smoothies and get too much fruit in their diet and make fruit smoothies. But if they're making so-called blended salads with a little bit of berry in there, that's okay. But, in, but, in, but there is an extra benefit from chewing it yourself as opposed to letting the blender do it. The extra benefit of chewing it is mixing it with the bacteria in the mouth forms more nitric oxide and other beneficial compounds, and it helps strengthen your teeth and gums when you chew well. So I think that we don't want people to smoothie and drink everything. I can occasionally have a green smoothie or a glass, you know, but that's fine. But I just don't want that to take the place of eating and chewing a salad. You follow me? Exactly. Uh, another condition people ask about, two conditions actually that, that mm -hmm. people have asked about, are your experience in, in uh, nutritarian diet and your kind of care with Parkinson's disease, kind of slowing the progression because most people, you know, they already have it. They're, you're not talking about preventing it. They have it and prostate problems. What's been your experience with those two conditions? Two people have asked about that. Is there any way of those are really tough, tough? Those are tough conditions. Those are the toughest conditions because they're not that easily reversible. So the answer is that we've seen a lot of prostate cancer reverse, but a lot of benign enlargement of the prostate is hard to reverse from all the years of muscular growth that occurred through this person's diet. It's hard to subtly change the shape of the prostate by eating right or fasting. I have not seen a um, consistent success with shrinking people's enlarged prostates. Um, so, and the other issue is Parkinson's. You may slow the progression. You may help them a little bit, but it's hard to get a complete cure once the Parkinson has advanced with, with more definitive um, what's the word, um, symptoms, you know, we're trying to do all the right things. And as you know, I make, I advocate that people don't let them get their, um, omega-3 index low because it increases their risk of Parkinson's on a vegan diet. So may, I want to make sure that people have an adequate omega-3 index. And a recent study just came out that showed that having an, an, a low omega-3 index below four had the same risk of premature death as a person who smoked cigarettes every day. So the equivalent, the risks of five years of life is lost with a low omega-3 index. So I'm very um, precautionary and making sure people have adequate omega-3 because we're all genetically different. And some of us make enough omega-3. Our index can be higher from our, our diet and other people can't make enough from their diet. So it behooves us or it's, it's in a protective nature, protective against Parkinson's and against dementia to check your blood level and make sure your blood level is above five, ideally, so you can supplement appropriately to get that level in the most favored range. Got it. Uh, so this is a, a back away from the disease again. Someone's asking, do you uh, recommend soaking or dehydrating nuts and seeds before you consume them? Is there any benefit uh, bio, bioavailability by doing so? Well, I don't generally soak my nuts. I don't even use soap most of the time. <laughs> And uh, what are you laughing? What are you? What did you assume that? Okay, <laughs> you just knew that was a joke, I guess, right? That's right. I do. So, uh, hemp seeds versus hemp hearts. Is there any difference? I didn't answer the question, though. Go ahead. Uh -uh. The answer is um, you change the nutritional profile, but the nutritional profile of non-soaked nuts is still an excellent food that leads to long life. So you don't have to soak your nuts, but if you want to sprout nuts or soak nuts or sprout seeds. It doesn't make the unsprouted nut or seed not healthy. It just makes the sprouted one or the soaked one to have a little different alternative nutritional profile, adding a little variety in your diet. So certainly you can choose to do that or not. Um, so, so, I, I, go ahead. And I do think that sprouts and microgreens are, are a very excellent addition to a salad or a nutritan or to a healthy diet. And I think we should take advantage of that. I do have a sprouter where I grow my own broccoli sprouts and alfalfa and, and I do also have some planters where I plant in, in peat and in clean trays, we plant some and grow microgreens and cut them and serve them on top of the salad because we know there's enhanced phytochemicals in baby plants 
and eating baby and youthful plants and adding that adds to the nutritional variety of our diet. Uh, another question about uh, stress and snacking it says, hi, Dr. Furman. I've been eating G bombs daily and love the di diet lifestyle, but I've been going through a particularly stressful time. Um, and I've been gaining weight due to nighttime snacking. How can I get back to eating only the three meals a day recommended and start feeling my best? How do you, how do you avoid snacking in stress? I think the word is smacking. We have to smack him, this person. <laughs> but anyway, the, um, it's very important not to eat at night and very important not to go to bed and food. We're all struggling with this and we're all in this together. And we're all encouraging each other to finish eating by six o'clock and eat a light enough dinner so you don't feel any food in your stomach or don't feel digestion is continuing when you go to bed at night. That you, a calorie consumed late at night is like double, is like two calories consumed in the morning. It's more likely to put on body fat. But worse than that, it ages you because we need to be at rest during nighttime to, to have the anti-aging phenomenon going on without digesting food. So I may sometimes overeat at dinner. I may sometimes want to eat something late at night because I'm still uh, hungry or attracted to something. But I'm trying to have people support me and, and knowing that I'm teaching and and knowing I know what's best for my health. And most of the times I'm, you know, telling somebody don't, you know, let's shut down the kitchen and let's do something else for the activity for the evening, you know, play cards, watch TV, tell jokes, sing, do, do um, karaoke, do something, but get away from the kitchen, get away from food. And if you need help for that, if you're snacking at night and can't help yourself, then you need some help. You need some other person to help you stay away from food after six o'clock at night. So, the, so that's why I have a heavier lunch, so I can have a lighter dinner and even go to bed on a completely empty stomach and not, be, not have um, too much food in my digestive tract late at night. So it's very serious what you're doing, and you're destroying the benefits of your healthy diet by overeating late at night. And, we need, and that's why we have people um, that have coaches and have their family members involved in helping them curtail their um, love, illicit love affair with dangerous food. So even overeating dried fruit or, or healthy desserts or overeating food in general is not a great idea. We always say half of what we eat supports our health and the other half of what we eat supports the needs of our doctor. If you know I, what I mean? I, it's a great note on which to end. Uh, Dr. Furman, we've covered a lot of ground. It's been a blast. You're always a blast. You always are just a wealth of information. It's just amazing. How many years you've been doing this now? I don't even know how old I am. <laughs> well, you're a little younger than me, so it's got to be about 40 years or so that you've been uh, you've been uh, um, preaching. Well, the I'm 68, so if I'm 68, I didn't start. I didn't go to medical school till I was 30, right? So I graduated about so about 29. I went to medical school. So let's say I'm out there when I'm 38. So 38 to 68. Wow, I've been doing it a long time. 48, 58. I've been doing it more than 30 years already, right? That's uh, you've accomplished a lot. And uh, if people want to see more of Dr. Furman, uh, again, the best way to see him is to go to the Eat to Live retreat. It's an amazing place. It's like his dream come true. It's an oasis. And in, in, I wouldn't call it a desert because that, that part of San Diego is beautiful, but it is an mm -hmm. oasis of health out there. So I recommend everybody just to, uh, boy, you want to recharge your battery, book a stay at the Eat to Live retreat. And you'll have, as I say, even if you have a health problem, you'll have fun getting healthy. So it's a great place to be. Uh, and if you, uh, if you, uh, if you can't uh, make it to the Eat to Live retreat, you can see Dr. Furman at the 2022 NHA conference, June 24th to the 26th in Cleveland. We hope you'll be there. And of course, visit his website where there's all kinds of resources. And uh, so Dr. Furman, it's been uh, tremendous having you here. Uh, it's, you, you, yeah, you I have a lot of synonymous with the, the NHA for as many years as I can remember. So it's great to have you. That's right. And we want to have good health so we can have more fun, right? Uh, absolutely. So fun in our last, lives, we take care of our health. Sure. So the last thing I want to tell for, we have a lot of the viewers here are not NHA members because these Power Your Health Q&As are free to anybody who signs up for them. But mm -hmm. uh, if, they are, uh, if they are interested in becoming a member of the NHA, we just launched a brand new website at healthscience.org where there's a lot more content, a lot easier navigation. And if you join the NHA, the latest issue of Health Science Magazine just came out. You can see it on our website when you join at Health Science. If you join the NHA within the next seven days and say you saw it on the Power Your Health Q&A, we'll send you a copy of this latest issue that literally just went in the mail 
to our members. It's a great publication. Joel writes for it. Uh, he's been interviewed in the publication. And all when you become a member of the NHA, all 43 years of back issues are available for nothing when you register on our site. So it's a great, great publication. It has 40 pages long, no advertising in it, just articles by the best of the best, like Dr. Furman. So again, Dr. Furman, it's been great having you here. Um, I thank all of our viewers. We've got a lot of people have been uh, joining us tonight and we can't wait till our next uh, monthly Q&A, Power Your Health Q&A. And I don't know whether Michelle, the coordinator of our Q&A is uh, here. Michelle, if, if you are, you can pop back in. If not, uh, we'll see you next month at our next month's Q&A. Uh, and uh, thank you all for listening. Michelle, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for coming, guys. Who's next, uh, next up for us? For uh, yeah, so just real quick, next month we've got Chris Work um, from Chris Beat Cancer. He's a coach who helps people uh, beat cancer using the plant-based diet and other things. The date of that um, is? The date of, of, of Chris Oh, Beat. yeah. So that's the fourth Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Let me see if I can pull up the date real fast. I believe it is the 22nd, February 22nd at 4 p.m. Pacific 7 p.m. Eastern. Who I follows, who follows, who's, who are, who's following that? Dr. Esser is after that. And then we've also got um, Dr. Funk, uh, the Christy um, Funk? famous Christy Funk, a famous breast cancer doctor. And then we've got Dr. Bolshewitz coming to visit us as well. And then before long, we'll have the uh, NHA conference. So that's, that's our lineup until the conference. You bet. So again, go to healthscience.org. There's a Power Your Health uh, Q&A link where you can just sign up for the program. It costs absolutely nothing, even if you're not a member of the NHA. But we certainly love to have you part of the NHA family because uh, we keep growing by leaps and bounds. And, uh, and I hope you get to meet you in person at the 2022 NHA conference. Uh, again, kind of like last year um, when, when everybody was uncertain where things were in February, were there going to be any live events? We hit the sweet spot and we're confident we're going to be there again. We've already got 250 people registered for the conference June 24th to the 26th. So we hope to see you there. Yeah, it was it was an absolute blast. I had so much fun and it's so energizing to see all those people there and just really get to connect and talk with people that, you know, like we do here that support the same things that you support. And I just wanted to apologize if we didn't get to your questions. I know there was a couple we were going to pop on and then we ran out of time, but um, thank you so much for submitting your questions and there'll be doctors in the future. Just resubmit your same question. Maybe we can do it next time as well. And by the way, so if you go to the new NHA website and you click on the link for NHA TV, you will see all of these Q and a, uh, series that we've done with Dr. Goldhammer and Robbie Barbero and Alan Gold and Joel Furman now. So again, join the NHA. It's only $35 a year, $65. You save five bucks for two years. You'll get the latest issue of the magazine. If you mention you saw it on the q and I'll put one in the mail to you. And uh, I think you'll, uh, you'll like what you see. So again, Michelle, thanks for putting all this together for us. Uh, that's it for this month's uh, Power Your Health Q&A. See you next month with uh, Chris Work. Good night. Sounds good.